This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com, featuring Stephanie Link, who shares her investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights with Action Alerts Plus, the multi-million dollar portfolio she manages with Jim Cramer. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Investors on edge, and they're selling stocks as the conflict between Ukraine and Russia escalates. What happens next? Is there anything the U.S. can do, and what does it mean for your money? Warren Buffett speaks. What does the world's most famous investor think about the crisis a half a world away? We talk to him about that, the economy, and much, much more. Sales stall. Winter storms kept car shoppers at home for the second straight month. Will dealers offer big incentives to get would-be buyers back in the showrooms? We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, March 3rd. Good evening, everyone. Alongside Susie Garib, I'm Tyler Matheson. Stocks sold off all around the globe today as jittery investors reacted sharply to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. All three major U.S. indexes had their worst one-day slides in a month, taking a cue from those overseas markets. The buildup of Russian troops in Ukraine over the weekend sparked a stern condemnation from the White House. What cannot be done is for Russia, with impunity, to uh, put its soldiers on the ground and uh, violate basic principles that uh, are recognized around the world. And uh, I think the strong condemnation that it's received from countries around the world indicates uh, the degree to which Russia's on the wrong side of history on this. As Russia tightened its grip on Ukraine's Crimea region, it was risk off in the equity markets with Russia's own stock market tumbling 12 percent and Russia's central bank was forced to hike interest rates to keep the value of its falling ruble from plunging even more. Volatility spiked at exchanges around the globe as investors pulled money out of higher risk stocks and switched cash into theoretically safer physical commodities. The price of gold hit a four month high. Crude oil shot up more than $2 a barrel, ending just shy of $105. The Dow was down as much as 250 points early in the session, but it battled back and ended just, just 153 points lower. The Nasdaq lost 30, and the S&P 500, which just reached an all-time closing high on Thursday, was down 13. While the threat of military action heats up, officials in Ukraine's capital try to find a diplomatic solution to the standoff and to look for immediate relief for the country's growing financial crisis. Steve Sedgwick has more from Kiev. On the ground here in Kiev, the Ukrainian capital on Monday, the pro-Western government reiterated its support for a peaceful and negotiated solution to the current political crisis, which has seen Russian military occupation in the Crimea. I spoke to the prime minister of the Ukraine today, who said to me he was willing to rebase the relationship with Russia, but on the proviso that there was no more military action in the Crimea and indeed broader Ukraine territory. The second crisis in this country is a financial crisis. Uh, and indeed, the economy minister admitted to me today uh, that the coffers were essentially empty, that the country was down to its last $15 billion of international foreign exchange reserves. But he remained hopeful that with the IMF in town and due to begin negotiations on Tuesday, uh, that a deal could be reached in four to five days. For Nightly Business Report, this is Steve Sedgwick in Kiev. With Russia already suffering financially from its move into Ukraine, the threat of economic sanctions from the U.S. and perhaps from other nations as well could have an even more serious impact on Moscow. Our Steve Leisman takes a look now at what economic leverage the U.S. and its allies may have against Russia. The U.S. has little economic pull to force Russia to give up Crimea, but some experts think it may not need it. The early conclusions that the fall of the pro-Russian Yanukovych government made Russian President Vladimir Putin look weak, and he invaded to respond to criticism inside the Kremlin and the country and to have a card in the future course of Ukraine. But ultimately, experts say occupying the Crimea or any part of Ukraine is at odds with Putin's own best interest, and the best the West can do is help him figure that out. Former NSC Russian analyst Tom Graham, now at Kissinger Associates, says Russia for many decades has wanted a Ukraine that is not in Western orbit. Annexing Ukraine or any other part of the country forces what's left of Ukraine toward the West and creates a volatile country on Russia's doorstep. 
The U.S. and the Western strategy is twofold. One, it's to put some pressures around the edges on Russia commercially and diplomatically kick them out of the G8. Then you come in with an IMF program and with direct support to enable the Ukrainian government to solidify itself. In addition to that, a senior administration official added, quote, the other part of the strategy is to offer him a way out. At every juncture, there's an off-ramp for Russia if they choose to de-escalate. That means the best response could be a united Western political front that agrees ultimately to national elections for president and for parliament. If there is escalation, it could come in the form of trade sanctions, banking restrictions, and military and intelligence aid to Ukraine. But severe banking restrictions, such as those imposed on Iran and North Korea, would take a long time to work and would be much harder to unify the West around them. So options are limited and of potentially limited effect. The hope is that Russia decides on its own that holding Crimea is not in its interest. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Well, despite the political turmoil in Ukraine, our guest tonight says the instability there will not weigh on the stock market here. He's Andres Garcia Amaya, global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Funds. Andres, nice to have you with us. Um, let me begin by just asking, why aren't you worried? And are you confident enough to tell and advise uh, investors to buy on the dips? So the first thing that I would say is that short term, I am worried, right? This uh, situation is very fluid and it could escalate before it de-escalates. Uh, but if you're a long term investor, right, if you're not trying to invest for the next week, but you're trying to invest for the next three years, next five years, we don't think that the issues in Ukraine are systemic for either the European economy or the U.S. economy. Uh, and that's our base case, right? And based on, on, on that assumption, we think that the U.S. equity market will be fine and European equities will be fine in the long term. The short term, sure, this is a risk-off environment and it might actually uh, see more volatility over the next few weeks. I assume, uh, Andres, that uh, Russia is included among the emerging markets and its stock market was down 12 percent or yep. so today. Uh, if you're in a general emerging markets fund, you're going to feel it, though, aren't you? Absolutely. Uh, I think short term, you'll see, uh, you'll take a hit there and you probably will take a hit in the next couple of weeks. Um, having said that, this is also going to create some opportunities for long term investors because not all of these countries that are put in the emerging market index are the same. Uh, for instance, India is in the emerging market index, uh, is one of the countries that, that I, I favor at this point over the next two or three years, yet it was down one and a half percent. Uh, doesn't have a lot to do with Ukraine or Russia, their economy doesn't, uh, yet it was down, right? So it should create some opportunities. You just need to be able to differentiate between the risk and the opportunity. So what kind of investment changes should an, an investors make? There's urgent emerging markets. You just talked about that. A lot of investors have stock in big U.S. multinationals right. that have a lot of trade with Europe, which could be impacted by this Ukrainian situation. So what kind of investment moves should uh, investors make in their portfolios? So I think your strategic portfolio should not change uh, based on the Ukrainian situation, right? Uh, if you sell now, then you have to have then you have two tough decisions. One. Did I make the right decision selling? And when do I have to re-enter the market? Right. So for long-term investors, we still believe staying invested is the best uh, is the best avenue to go. Obviously, you need active management. Uh, you need people that understand what's happening on the grounds and make those tactical decisions. But when it comes to your long-term investment horizon, right, if you're trying to retire one day, the situation in Ukraine should not change your overall portfolio. Talk to me about the commodities scenario. Gold up today, oil higher, nat gas has been on a roller coaster. Yeah. What's next? Yeah, so one thing to note, because uh, a lot of people are concerned about natural gas specifically, if you think about Ukraine, why it matters so much to Europe, is a conduit to, for them to get uh, Russian natural gas, right? So the good news here is that Europe, unlike the United States, had a mild winter. They actually have a ton of inventory of natural gas, more than 20 percent that they usually do by this point. So natural gas in the short term could see a spike, but when it comes to actually supply constraints, Europe should be okay. And as we know here in the United States, we have a lot of natural gas that we're producing that we actually might end up uh, exporting to Europe at one point if Russia continues to escalate uh, the situation in Ukraine. So, Andres, I, you heard our report from Steve Leisman. So it seems unlikely that there will be any kind of um, trade sanctions or banking restrictions. But what if? What if something like that does happen? What advice would you be giving investors? 
the same advice that I mentioned earlier, right? This could get worse before it gets better. Very fluid situation. I can't really predict what the next 24, 48 hours will give you. But at the end of the day, if you think about the next two or three years and you think about the, your investments, this really shouldn't change the picture, right? And something that was mentioned earlier that I think is key, the pressure on Russia could come from the markets. Just to put this into, per, into perspective, uh, it was mentioned earlier that Russian equities were down 12%. That's over $50 billion of market capitalization that is gone, right, overnight. That is more money that Russia spent in the Olympics, right? So this will put p uh, pressure on Putin, maybe not the U.S. directly through policy, but the markets at times uh, put pressure on, on these type of situations as well. All right, Andres, fascinating uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Andres Garcia Amaya, he's global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Funds. Still ahead, when stocks sell off like they did today, what does legendary investor Warren Buffett do? The answer and his take on everything from the economy to the stock market straight ahead. Americans made more money in January, and despite all that harsh weather, we spent even more of it. The Commerce Department says personal income rose three-tenths of one percent in January, following no increase at all in December. But spending was up by four-tenths of one percent that month, mostly on higher energy prices, while spending in December, which included the heart of the holiday shopping period, was revised lower. Separately, factory activity rebounded from an eight-month low last month as new orders bounced back. Warren Buffett, the nation's best-known investor, famously said that investors should be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. So how does the oracle of Omaha see the market right now, especially with tensions in Ukraine, making many investors fearful? Becky Quick talked with him about that, but started with the other big issue on investors' minds, the U.S. economy. We've had this moderate but consistent growth uh, now for four and a half years. And every now and then we get excited about it speeding up. And every now and then we start worrying about a double dip. We haven't gotten wildly optimistic and, and we haven't gotten wildly pessimistic. But over that period, you've seen these small waves of optimism and pessimism. And, and really, the, you know, it's just been pretty darn steady uh, improving. You also revealed something in the annual letter this year where you said you laid out the terms of your will, what you've set aside <laughs> for your wife, which I didn't know any of this. Yeah. You... I, I laid out what I thought the average person who's not an expert on stocks should do. And, and my widow will not be an expert on stocks. And, and I want to be sure she gets a, a, a decent result. I, I, she doesn't need to get a sensational result. Yeah. And since all my Berkshire shares are going to philanthropy, uh, the question becomes, what does she do with the cash that's left to her? And I've been, part of it goes outright, part of it goes to a trustee. But I've told the trustee to put 90 percent of it in an S&P 500 index fund and 10 percent in, in, in short-term governments. And, and the reason for the 10 percent in short-term governments is that if there's a terrible period in the market and she's withdrawing 3 or 4 percent a year, you take it out of that instead of selling stocks at the wrong time. She'll do fine with that. And anybody will do fine with that. It's low cost. It's in a bunch of wonderful businesses. And you know, that takes care of itself. You specifically said a Vanguard index, which yeah, caught right. my attention. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's a very, very low-cost index fund. But in the letter to shareholders, you did lay out something that's been on the horizon that you are concerned about, and that's what's happening with pension funds, the promises that have been made. Well, the government pensions are, aren't, aren't the problem that private pensions are. The, gov the, the government, uh, government has the power to tax, <laughs> and it has the power to print money. Uh, we are not in a dangerous U.S. fiscal situation. We, at some, we have to quit having our, our debt grow as a percentage of GDP. It made sense to have it happen during when, when, when things were terrible five years ago. But we can have a deficit which creates more debt, but not at a rate that is, grows faster than GDP growth. You know, the, the trend is wrong. There is a danger if that goes on, although a lot of countries have gone far beyond where we've gone. But I, I don't like seeing it go up as a percentage of GDP. But this, 
this country is in wonderful shape. And finally, just looking at the stock market today, there have been a lot of people nervous about what's happened in the situation in Ukraine. You would tell them. I would tell them it doesn't change anything. If, if you've got a... If you've got a wonderful business of your own, you know, in Peoria, Illinois, why in the world would you sell it today because, because of what's happening in Ukraine? If you've got a farm that's producing for you, if you've got an apartment house that's fully occupied, why in the world would you sell it today because of what's happening in Ukraine? The same applies if you have a wonderful, a piece of a wonderful business or a piece of many wonderful businesses. People do, they react too much to short-term things in, in, in the stock market, whereas they behave quite rashly when they get into other investments. In fact, when prices are down, Buffett says he simply buys more stock. He says that this morning he checked out the price of a stock he'd been buying in London last Friday. If prices drop like we've been seeing, he says he'll just buy more. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Becky Quick. And when it comes to specific companies, Buffett said Coca-Cola, a major Berkshire Hathaway holding, is facing more headwinds than it was 10 years ago. As for Pepsi, he doesn't think it should split up, as activist investor Nelson Peltz has been advocating. And he said he feels, quote, fine with IBM CEO Ginny Romney and likes the company's stock buybacks. Darden Restaurants warns severe winter weather took a big bite out of quarterly sales, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The parent of Red Lobster and Olive Garden estimated a third quarter profit that fell well short of expectations. The company also said its plan to spin off Red Lobster is still on track, rebuffing two activist investment firms that urged Darden to take other actions to bolster results. Shares plunged more than 5 percent today, finishing at $48.33. Pfizer is hoping to sell an over-the-counter version of its blockbuster cholesterol drug Lipitor. The drug maker started to uh, test to see if it's safe for patients to take Lipitor without doctor guidance. If approved by the FDA, this would be the first statin available without a prescription. Shares were off slightly nonetheless to $31.98. Shares of Dendrion surged on news the drug maker will launch its prostate cancer vaccine over in Europe. The drug will first be available in the U.K. and Germany, but an exact release date has not been set. Nevertheless, that helped investors shrug off weaker than expected fourth quarter results, and the stock surged almost 15 percent to $3.31. Investors sold shares of Citi today on news of an investigation by a federal grand jury over the bank's compliance with anti-money laundering and bank secrecy laws. Citi received subpoenas just a few days after it announced its Mexican banking unit had been defrauded of as much as $400 million. Shares fell 2 percent, closing at 47.61. Microsoft shares fell on some news of changes in top management. New CEO Satya Nadella has tapped Mark Penn to head up Microsoft's strategy unit. He's a former Clinton family aide and a Microsoft executive vice president overseeing advertising and strategy. Two other executive vice presidents will also leave the software company. Shares were down more than 1 percent to $37.78. Men's Warehouse and Joseph A. Bank are one step closer to a possible merger. The two retailers agreed to exchange confidential information to work toward evaluating a combination. Now, Men's Warehouse also said it received a draft merger agreement from Joseph A. Bank. Shares of both companies rose slightly today. Men's Warehouse closed at $54.10, Joseph A. Bank at $62.30. And FedEx's freight business will increase shipping rates by almost 4 percent at the end of March. Just last month, FedEx increased its domestic express shipping rates. The hikes come as the company faces a shift towards cheaper shipping services. Shares rose a fraction to $133.38. And an update now on a story on the frigid weather. We brought you this story recently here on Nightly Business Report. The Great Lakes are now more than 90 percent covered in ice. That is the most ice cover in 34 years. I'm cold just looking at it. With a massive Arctic front forecast for the area over the next few days, climatologists predict the ice cover will set a new record this week, topping 95 percent. And the potential economic impact could be enormous as 20,000 tons of cargo, including coal, fuel, iron ore, need to get through the lakes during these winter months alone. Well, speaking of the cold weather, coming up, how much did the bitter cold stall sales of new cars last month? And what might happen when the temperature warms up?
Apple is driving a brand new product into some high-end new cars. The tech giant's automobile infotainment system called CarPlay will make its debut this week in new vehicles from Ferrari, Mercedes-Benz, and Volvo. CarPlay allows iPhone owners to make calls, access maps, get directions, listen to music, and respond to text messages, all at the push of a button located on the steering wheel. Well, no matter how many of those high-tech gadgets there are aimed at boosting new car sales, there were no match for the bitter cold weather and pounding snowstorms that kept a lot of would-be buyers at home last month. The nation's two biggest automakers, GM and Ford, both saw sales declines in February. Sales at Chrysler, though, surged 11 percent on big sales of Jeeps and Dodge Ram pickups. Phil LeBeau joins us now from Chicago with more on who won, who lost, and if automakers expect business to pick up when the weather turns better. Phil, let me start with the weather. Is it really the weather that caused these sales de uh, declines or is something else going on? No, I think it is the weather, Susie. When you talk with dealers, and I've talked with a number of them around the country, they're just not seeing the traffic, especially on the really cold and snowy days. When the weather has improved, and it didn't improve a lot in February, but on those days when it did improve, they saw traffic come back. And that gives them confidence that at the end of the day, the buyer wants to come in and buy once they have the confidence to get out into the weather. And let's be honest, I haven't wanted to go out a whole lot here in Chicago, and I'm sure you haven't in New York either. No, absolutely not, Phil. All right, so our inventory's backing up, and will that mean that there'll be uh, big deals when uh, people go out again? We're already starting to see better deals in particular segments. Pickup trucks is a good example. Actually, the inventory levels for some of the pickup trucks, the most popular ones, actually came down a little bit in the month of February. But we're still looking at larger than usual inventories. And I suspect, Tyler, that as we go through the month of March, if those inventories remain where they are, we'll start to see more deals. And, and how is March shaping up, uh, Phil? And, you know, who, who's going to win, who's going to lose in this whole thing? I heard, you know, somebody the other day saying, I'm going to buy an SUV because after this nasty, all these snowstorms, <laughs> you really want a car that has traction and works well in the snow. Right. Well, Susie, pickups and SUVs have been very popular over the last year and a half, and I expect that to continue in March. Look, all of the automakers are banking on warmer weather, bringing people into the showroom, and if that happens, they expect a big surge in March, April, and May. Now, keep in mind, we said the same thing at the beginning of February, that if there was better weather, we'd see better sales. So it hasn't started well for this month. Let's see what happens over the next three or four weeks. All right, Phil, thank you very much. Phil LeBeau reporting from Chicago for us tonight. And finally tonight, Forbes magazine is out with its annual list of the world's billionaires. And there are more of them than ever before, more than 1,600 along with the most women ever on the list, 172 female billionaires. As for the richest of the rich, in third place, the Spanish clothing retailer Amancio Ortega, best known for the Zara fashion chain, he's worth $64 billion. Slipping into second place after four straight years on top, the Mexican telecom mogul Carlos Slim Elu and his family, who are worth about $72 billion. And back in first place, worth $76 billion, yep, the American guy, Harvard dropout turned technology legend, Bill Gates. Microsoft founder has topped the list for 15 of the past 20 years. And we were talking earlier about Warren Buffett. Where did he end up? Fourth place. He's got more than $58 billion. I'd be happy with $58 billion. I, I could live yeah. with that. Yeah. You know, what I found interesting on the list, you mentioned a lot of women, but I also noticed a lot of the billionaires are under 40. Many of them are tech because of tech billionaires. And most of the billionaires, about 500 of them, are from the U.S. And the other thing that stood out to me, how many of the Walton family are on that list yes. one way or another? The Walmart fortune really moves. Thanks to Sam Walton. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garrow, and we want to remind you that this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support, and your support makes programs like Nightly Business Report possible. And I'm Tyler Matheson. On behalf of your public TV station, thank you for your support. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Founded by Jim Cramer, TheStreet.com is an independent source for stock market analysis. Kramer's Action Alerts Plus is home to his multi-million dollar portfolio. You can learn more at thestreet.com slash NBR.
I'm Susie Garrett with the Nightly Business Report News Brief. Stocks sold off all around the globe today as jittery investors reacted sharply to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. All three major U.S. indexes had their worst slides in a month. Investors pulled money out of higher-risk stocks and put more into safer haven commodities. The price of gold hit a four-month high, and oil shot up more than $2 to about $105 a barrel. The Dow lost 153 points. It had been down as much as 250 points. The Nasdaq fell 30 and the S&P was off 13 points. Higher energy prices boosted consumer spending in January, which outpaced gains in personal income. And bitter cold weather in February held back auto sales, with Ford and GM posting sales declines, but sales at Chrysler surged 11%. Be sure to tune into Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.